Welcome back. Today we're going to start to tackle the question of how do I model my atomic system. There are so many different combinations of systems and so many different ways you can model them that we need a place to start and to we need a place to start understanding how do we approach modeling these systems. So specifically, we're going to talk about atomistic potentials. We're going to look at atomistic potentials in the context of three different categories. Now there are a bunch of different ways you could categorize atomistic potentials. We're going to start with these because they pretty much encompass all atomic potentials. First you have pair potentials, which are pretty much the first potentials and the simplest potentials, where the energy of any atom is simply the summation of the pair interactions between it and all the other atoms around it. Next you have the many body potential, which takes into account the arrangement of atoms around it. So it's not simply how far away all the other atoms are around it, but where they are uh, in relationship to each other as well. Finally, we're going to look at bond order potentials, which are typically used for polymeric systems, something with chains and uh, strong chemical bonds. The way we're going to look at this first is through this flowchart. And essentially, this gives us a way of starting and where to look for the potentials that we want to model our systems. When we start out, we need to know what material type are we trying to model. Um, if we are modeling a me metallic system or a ceramic system, um, there's another question that we need to ask. Are we modeling something with an isotropic structure? Basically, if something has an isotropic structure, we can simplify the potentials that we're using. So if yes, um, for a high fidelity simulation, you still want to use a many body potential, but there are some potentials that don't take into account the uh, angular dependence of the atoms around it um, that are still many body, uh, like EAM and EIM. And so those are a good place to start for high fidelity simulations. If you're looking for something quicker, then for an isotropic structure, you can typically get away with a pair potential, uh, something like Leonard Jones, or there's a bunch of pot pair potentials out there. If you don't have an isotropic structure, if you have free surfaces or if you have like an HPC crystal, then you need something that takes into account the angular dependence. Um, so you, you typically do need a many body potential. Uh, the high fidelity ones would be something like Neem or ADP, and there's certainly others. Um, a low fidelity one would be a hybrid potential where you're combining a simple um, many body term like ATM in lamps uh, with a pair potential like Leonard Jones. Now, if you go back to the beginning and you're actually modeling like a liquid or a gas, uh, then you can get, you can usually use pair potentials. Um, now, those could be Leonard Jones potentials. Or uh, if you're modeling water, then there's uh, tip potentials. And there's a bunch of other potentials, of course, for water as well. That's been a popular one. Um, but typically, if you're looking at liquids or gases, uh, because there's no long range structure, uh, you can get away with pair potentials, or you can model the interactions with pair potentials. Now if we go to the next material type, looking at polymers, like I mentioned, you typically need to do uh, bond order potentials like REAX or REBO. You can also, for a low fidelity simulation, you can explicitly model the bonds um, and use some sort of driving potential uh, where bonds are essentially modeled as springs as well. And of course, there's other potentials for those as well. So let's look in just very briefly uh, in a little more depth at the different types of potentials, beginning with the pair potential. So as I mentioned, for a pair potential, the energy of any particular atom, EI in this equation, is the sum of the pair energies between I, the ith atom, and all other atoms. So in other words, it the energy only depends on the distances between the ith atom and any, all the other atoms. So if they were, all the other atoms were in a straight line between it, you know, they're all lined up, then that energy would be no different than if they were scattered all the way around for the ith atom. Of course, the total system energy would be different, but for the ith atom, that would not change anything. 
the pair function often decays quickly with distance, therefore the scope of that function is usually limited by a cutoff radius just to help the numerics uh, in the efficiency. Now many body potentials are similar. Typically it's a combination of a pair term and a many body term. Um, but in this case, the energy of any ith atom is based on the locations of all of the atoms in the surrounding region. So in one example, if you have a three body term, then you'd have a double summation where you have to take into account contributions of the pair energy that also take into account the its pairs. So in other words, if the, the energy for the ith atom will depend on the, the location of a j, j atom and a k atom, where the j and the k can be all other atoms. So you have to look through all those different combinations. So the result is you have this double summation, which is usually a, a double for loop in your code. And they're typically quite a bit more expensive to calculate. But they do reflect the properties of especially solid materials much more accurately. Finally, we're going to talk about bond order potentials. And again, usually it's a combination of a pair potential and a bond term. It can also have a many body term in there, um, but this bond term is the main unique thing about bond order potentials. Essentially, this bond term represents the, con the energy, uh, energy contribution of the bonds between bonded atoms. So exam for example, between a carbon and hydrogen pair, there's going to be a strong chemical bond, and so the contribution of the energy of that bond would come in through this term. And it's usually through this bond order coefficient, this Bijk, and that bond order coefficient uh, can depend on three atom interactions as well. So really the bond order potential is also a many body potential, but it's specifically related to uh, strong chemical bonds. So those are the basic categories of potentials. Um, hopefully this gets you started and gives you a place to start looking for potentials to model your systems and to evaluate what type of potentials I need for the information that I'm trying to get out of my model. If you noticed any important potentials that I missed, I'm always looking for new potentials and the ways those potentials are used, so leave those potentials in the comments below. And thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.